and welcome to day two of our web series, um, falling, The Phases of Falling in Love. Um, today we're working on the um, couple part, you know, after we are, you know, falling in love, um, now it's official and we're a couple. And today I'm going to be talking about, um, you know, hashtag couple goals. Um, you know, we see all over uh, social media um, pictures of couples and with the hashtag couple goals. Um, and it's almost become this kind of like modern day keep up with the Jones. You see a lot of people who um, kind of uh, see that picture and then do it themselves, um, pose it that way themselves and then, you know, post it. Um, so it's almost like, um, you know, it's definitely a, a trend. And, uh, you know, we look at that and we think, you know, that's something that really want, we really want. Or we want to show the world that, you know, we are a, a power couple or, a, you know, a cutesy couple or that we're best friends. Um, so is it just about appearances, though? Is it all about, you know, um, just creating a life, this social media life and how we want the world to see us? Or is there something else, um, a deeper meaning uh, behind those pictures that we are so envious and jealous of when we see of others? Um, other people posting. So I have looked through uh, a lot of the hashtag goal or um, hashtag couple goals and um, kind of um, just looked um, a little bit deeper into what it is that people are really wanting, not just the pose, but um, what deeper meaning is there. Um, so with the first one, we have a picture of people who are um, snuggling, usually wrapped up in each other's arms, um, napping on the couch or um, in a tent or, um, you know, in bed. And what is it about that picture that um, we want to emulate and copy? Is it just a pose or is there something else? Well, when you think about it, when you... Um, are sleeping with someone, actually sleeping, um, and resting, you know, you're all, it's a very, it's another form of intimacy, you know, it's a physical form of affection, like a hug, but, um, you know, what someone's looking for is a deeper connection and affection, not just something physical, but, you know, some um, affection. They want someone who will, um, you know, spend time, and it, it's another way of of showing how much you love someone too by um, cuddling up on the couch with them and spending the evening watching movies. Um, it's a form of saying, you know, I love you. You're you're important to me right now, and right now there's no one else in the world that I want to be with. Um, so that's definitely, I would say, the meaning behind you know that pose. Um, the second one is, um, you know, pictures of um, someone buying uh, some stuff or when someone's sick. So, you know, taking care of your partner when they're not feeling well. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. You know, when we're not feeling well, it's nice to know that our partner is going to take care of us, you know, whether it's just buying some soup and making sure that we're resting, you know, getting some juice, um, making sure that we're have our favorite movies and and you know box of tissues whatever it, it is that we need um, that they're going to be there to take care of us when we are not feeling well um, you know everybody wants that in their relationship they want someone who will take care of them um, when they are not feeling well so um, number three road trips and making memories and this is kind of fun these cute little pictures of couples who are holding hands while they're driving in a car or doing adventurous stuff like going camping or hiking. Um, and that's another thing is we want our partner to be adventurous. We want to go new places and try new things, um, you know, have fun. We want them to be like a best friend to us and um, try new things. Um, it's also another level of intimacy to go out and try some new things um, 
definitely can help you deepen your bond with your partner. So um, four, um, surprising your partner with something that's their favorite. Maybe it's um, their favorite, you know, maybe it's a takeout from their favorite restaurant or um, maybe it's their favorite flowers or um, a game. Um, I remember um, early on in my relationship um, with my husband, he would bring home my favorite candy bar once in a while when he was at the store. And it just makes you feel really loved. You know, we all want our partner to, um, you know, not just um, think of us on our birthdays or holidays, but also to think of us, you know, when they're just going to the store and they thought, hey, I know my partner loves Cheetos, so I'm going to pick them up a little bag of Cheetos. Um, it's just a sweet little gesture to let us know that they're thinking of us. So number five. Um, leaning on each other through hard times. Um, you know, life is definitely a cycle of um, ups and downs, and it's nice to know that our partner has our back when we are going through a, a really difficult, painful time, um, whether it's a death in the family, um, we lose a job, um, get in a fight with our very best friend, um, you know, the loss of a pet, um, you know, when we go through those hard, hard times, it's nice to know that someone is going to be there and be our best friend and biggest supporter um, for when we are, you know, going through really, really tough times. It's important to have someone who's always going to be there and support us and be emotionally supportive, um, who will let us, you know, uh, be vulnerable and cry and and not um, shame us for feeling um, you know sad about um, losing our job or trying to downplay it um, so it's really important to have someone um, that is there for the good times and the bad times uh, number six um, having a special place to hang out that's just yours uh, me and my husband, we, uh, when we first got together, we uh, both had mornings off. So after uh, taking the kids um, off to school, um, we would go up to a little breakfast restaurant and it would just be the two of us. Um, we never took the kids, it was our special place. So that we went where it was just us and we never invited anybody else. Um, it was, it was uh, like kind of like our little sacred space, a little tradition that we like to do. So I think it's important to have um, places or, or things that you do where it's just the two of you. Um, it kind of shows that you're willing to um, uh, stay connected and that you know, you're putting each other um, you know, as a top priority in your life and willing to, you know, be each other's best friend. So, and number seven, the last one, um, being your authentic self. Um, so we all have uh, maybe something that we really, really like, but maybe we don't share it with the world. Um, it might be some little weird thing where everyone else um, maybe judges us or looks at us like we're crazy. So it's good to have a partner who is going to um, accept us unconditionally and kind of uh, love our little quirks and weird um, things that uh, we like to do. Um, you know, we all want to be accepted and loved and not judged or shamed for liking something, especially if it's, you know, we're not harming anybody or ourselves and it's safe and it's not legal then you know what's the big deal <laughs> so um, so it's really important because then we feel like someone is as, as really loving us and accepting us as we are and not trying to change us or fit us into some mold so those are the seven
but only those things which your heightened feelings are telling you to do. Infatuation just keeps throwing you deeper into your delusions, making you think of this perfect life and perfect person. And you always thought these were signs of love, right? Well, there's a difference between love and infatuation. And knowing the difference between love and infatuation can help you navigate your partnering and potential romances towards something more meaningful. If your intention is to have a meaningful, lasting love relationship with your significant other or soulmate. If you want to attract your true love, you need to avoid wasting your time with infatuation. Okay, there's nothing wrong with dating. In fact, dating, getting out there and connecting with people in the anticipatory vibration of connecting with someone, getting to know them better, and being open to all the possibilities of having a deep and meaningful relationship is exactly what you want to do. This is a positive, magnetic vibration that will attract your partner. But if you're in a superficial, infatuation-fueled one-on-one relationship with the wrong person, and your potential soulmate wanders into your gravitational field, he or she will likely not take notice of you and walk on. So date, yes, but resist the temptation to be totally enthralled with the wrong person so that you don't miss your opportunity to be available when the right one appears on the horizon. Love is not superficial adoration, keeping you in a panic sense of urgency where you lose yourself, while you're highly motivated by sex. Love is not acting out your part of pretending to be in love or impressing your partner. Love is not letting someone control you or exerting a great deal of effort to support the illusion. Love is not these things. This is infatuation. Love is wanting to be with your partner in a deep and meaningful way, with a desire to share an open and honest connection that flows both ways, loving and supporting each other, you desire a deep understanding one with the other. When you communicate, you find yourself unguardedly connecting even more and having meaningful conversations, cherishing the ability to share who you really are, mentally, physically, revealing all your secrets with no lies and willing to be vulnerable. You desire a healthy sexual relationship with your partner, but it's not the primary driving force. You are blessed just basking in the presence of your partner, even if just cuddling on the couch. Being in love means you can relax into a communion with your partner that is natural. And there's no need to feel pressure to impress each other or those who might be observing your relationship from the outside. Love deepens. Compassion and respect grow as you and your partner open up and share your intimacies one with the other. If you can keep your infatuation at bay, true love can find you, and you will be ready for it. Can infatuation turn into love? Can friends become lovers? Can you be friends once you've been there? Yes, all these things are possible if you stay true to yourself and preserve the sacred space for having all the love your heart desires, and it will come to you. I'm David M. Masters. You can find out more about me at davidmmasters.com. And make sure you visit my friends at St. Paul's Free University. Catch you later. Our dreams before marriage are of marital bliss. After all, most of our examples are Cinderella and the TV shows where Prince Charming sweeps us off our feet to live happily ever after. They forget the real life portion. Most of us enter marriage or a relationship by way of the in love experience. We meet someone whose physical attributes as well as personality create an electrical connection to trigger our system to alert us of the love feelings. This is where we start 
the process of getting to know the person. We start dating, going out to dinner, maybe a movie. However, our true interest is most likely not what is playing at the theater. Our intention is truly to find love. Could this electric, eccentric, tingly feeling inside be just that, real love? Is the quest to find real love, you may learn, in the quest to find real love, you may learn things about your potential partner that is a total deal breaker. It could even be on the first date. That's when that tingly, eccentric feeling just disappears. Other times, that feeling seems to ignite more and more with each encounter you have and you find yourself just wanting more and more of it. You may even say something like, I think I'm falling in love. Eventually, you are convinced it is the real thing. This is the real deal. At this point, many discuss marriage or moving in together or whatever that next step looks like for them. After all, you're in love. At its peak, the in love experience is euphoric. Can you stay emotionally obsessed with each other? You just can't stop thinking about each other. Some go as far as to say they long to be together. Embracing stimulates dreams of marriage and ecstasy. When a person is in love, they have an illusion that their beloved is perfect. Couples' dreams before they marry are of marital bliss. Of course, you'll have your differences. However, they will be handled openly and you will always reach an agreement. Those are the thoughts. It is the next to impossible to believe anything else when you are in love. As men and women, we have been led to believe that if we are really in love, it's going to just last forever. Nothing could ever overcome your love for each other. It's total bliss. The most wonderful thing you have ever experienced. You talk about the fact that other couples have lost their feelings. However, you agree that that's not going to happen to you. You guys are in love. We're in love. Well, here is some truth. The eternality of the in love experience is, yeah, are you ready? It's fiction, not fact. Dr. Dorothy Tanove, a psychologist, has done long range studies on this in love experience. She concluded that the average lifespan of a romantic obsession is about two years. If it is a secret love affair, it might last a little bit longer. Eventually, we all descend from the clouds and come back to earth with our eyes wide open and are able to see all the, oh, as she calls them, warts of the other person. Yes, warts of the other person. We are able to see that some of our partner's personality traits are downright irritating and ugly. Some behavior patterns are annoying. They have the capacity to be critical and judgmental. Oh yes, those little traits we overlooked when we were, oh yes, in love, are now huge mountains. Welcome to the real world of relationships and marriage where there are lots of senseless little arguments like you left the cap off the toothpaste again? You put the toilet paper on the roll backwards? It goes over, not under. It's a world where the dishes do not do themselves or walk to the kitchen alone and clothes do not wash themselves. In this world, a look can hurt and a word can crush. Intimate lovers can become enemies, and marriage or the relationship, a battlefield. What the hell happened to the in love experience? What happened to the better?
for better or worse. It was but an illusion. Feelings of, did we really have the real thing? Feeling tricked or deceived? The problem is faulty information. The faulty information is the idea that the in-love obsession would last forever. Let's look at why it's being called an obsession. Someone who is in love cannot think about anything else. If everyone in the world went around like that, no one would be able to complete their jobs. Everyone would stay home in bed cuddling all day. College students would never graduate because they cannot concentrate. Everyone would be daydreaming 24-7. Yikes! The in-love state gives the illusion that you have an intimate relationship. You feel like you belong to, the, to each other. You feel like you could conquer the world's problems. Here are three reasons the falling in love experience is not real. First, falling in love is not an act of the will or a conscious choice. No matter how much we want to fall in love, we cannot make it happen. It often happens at an inappropriate time, inopportune time, when we least expect it. Second, falling in love is not real love because it is effortless. The in love state takes very little discipline, if any or conscious effort on your part, or our part. Third, one who is in love is not genuinely interested in fostering the personal growth of the other person. Most often, only purpose we have when we fall in love is to lose the feelings of loneliness. Unfortunately, marriage is often used for just that. The in love experience does not focus on our own personal growth or that of the other person. It gives the sense that you have arrived. You no longer need to grow. Our beloved is perfect, and so am I. Recognize the in-love experience for what it really is. A temporary emotional high. So now you can pursue real love. You ask, what does that look like? It is the kind of love that requires effort and discipline. It is the choice to use your energy in a way to benefit the other person. Knowing that if your partner's life is enriched by your actions and efforts, yours will be as well. To have the satisfaction of having genuinely loving another does not require the euphoria of the in-love experience. In fact, true love cannot begin until the in-love experience has run its course. The beautiful things we do while in that in-love obsession we cannot take credit for. It is an instinctual force that goes beyond our normal behavior. However, once we return to the real world of human choice and we make the choice to be kind and loving. That is real love. The good news here is there is hope for married couples who have lost all their in love feelings. Love is a choice, so you have the capacity to love after the in love obsession has died and you and your partner have returned to the real world. That kind of love begins with an attitude or a way of thinking that says, I'm married to you. I choose to look out for your interests, as well as finding ways to express that decision to love. You might be thinking, uh, that seems so unexciting and blah. Where are the shooting stars, balloons, and exciting emotions? The twinkle in the eye, the out-of-this-world sex, well, as we covered, 
that is mostly an illusion. And in order to have real love, you must meet each other's deep emotional needs. As humans, one of our deepest emotional needs is to feel loved. Someone making the conscious choice to learn what our needs are and choosing to find ways to meet them will be exciting beyond anything you ever felt when you were infatuated. Tune in tomorrow as we discuss the five love languages and learn that you can fill your partner's love tank. I'm Wendy Johnson with Wendy Johnson's Life Coaching and St. Paul's Free University. Hi everyone, welcome back to day three of the Permaculture Relationships series. This is now phase three, survival of the fittest. So if you're just joining us in this series, what I'm doing is I'm attempting to apply the principles of permaculture, um, which is often used for agricultural purposes and planning purposes for a homestead to relationships, right? Because the, the term permaculture, as you've heard if you have listened to the other lectures in this series, is permanent culture and human relationships are a huge part of successful culture and if we want to live a sustainable lifestyle um, a more pleasant lifestyle that's nature focused we need to have good relationships involved in that and so what I do here is I'm looking at the principles of nature the patterns that come up repeatedly um, in nature and we're using those as the guiding principles to design our relationships <clears throat> and today's uh, relationship phase one of the seven phases of love by David and Masters is sobering up. Now this is probably the most serious of all the phases of the relationships because so many relationships get to this phase and they peter out. It's seen as the chasm <clears throat> between having you know a fun fling and a fun short-term relationship and really building up that lasting long-term rock-solid relationship that so many people are looking for and so few people are actually finding. So Sobering up is the breaking point and where the work really starts. And the, the pattern in nature that I'm looking at here is the one uh, that we often find as survival of the fittest, right? It's nature looks at what's going on, it tries lots of different things, and in the end, only a few of the, you know, what's actually working survives. You know, everything has a life cycle. Everything lives and then dies. <clears throat> and if your relationship is no longer at the point where it's growing, where it's becoming more and more plentiful, more and more bountiful, right? And it's not only giving to you, but you giving to them and to the community around you, right? A relationship isn't just about the people in it, but it's about your place in the world, you know, the, the, your place in the larger family, in the community, in nature, in society, right? If it's not fulfilling all of those roles, <clears throat> eventually it will be cold. It will be taken out of the rotation and something better hopefully will come up. But at least something new will come up in a, a different attempt at reaching the ultimate goal, which is something that is plentiful, bountiful, successful. <clears throat> so the first question I think you should ask yourself when you're at this phase you know, where you're, you're feeling like the relationship is under strain is, has this relationship served its purpose already? Right? Is this the best that could have come out of it? Some relationships, you know, it, a relationship that ends at this phase is not necessarily a failure, if that's what the purpose of the relationship was. <clears throat> it could be that this person was good for you at that time in your life when you started dating, but no, you've grown and it's not, you know, it doesn't serve you, either of you, any longer to stay together. Okay, so is this a chance to make a break? The worst thing you can do with a relationship that has, you know, matured, it's given its fruit, is to hold on to it and keep trying to grow it because you're just throwing good effort and good nutrients and good water after the bad, right? Trying to prop up something that's dead and decaying doesn't get you anywhere. The best thing you could possibly do is harvest the fruits, <clears throat> say thank you, you know, and leave on amiable terms. Go you know, look at what you've gotten from it and make the best out of it. <clears throat> so 
So, and the reason why this comes up so much as, you know, a difficult problem is a lot of people, when the relationship's over, they are, you know, they don't want to put the effort in to move on or they're afraid of what could come next. Um, and so really take a hard look at yourself, a hard look at the relationship and say, is this the time to make the cut? You know, do I need to step up here and, and make a move? <clears throat> but the other thing to consider is, are you at an inflection point? Or, there's no such thing as the perfect fairy tale relationship. And in nature, transformation is usually accompanied by some amount of discomfort, a ton of energy output. And it takes, you know, these trying times to birth into a new reality, right? Just human birth alone, it's such a trying uh, event for everybody involved. But without it, we wouldn't have, you know, none of us would be alive. In the picture, the that transformation from the... Uh, <clears throat> from the caterpillar to the cocoon and then out to the butterfly. You know, butterflies couldn't exist without that trying time of in the cocoon where the, the being is being, the, the caterpillar that went in is being chemically ripped apart and re-transfigured into something new and using all of its energy that accumulated over so much time of so much good time of plenty and investing that into its new form. So you may be in the state of new relationships where it's time to make an investment and to grow it from the soft, gooey caterpillar into something that is much more capable of surviving through the future. So this time in your relationship is really the threshold of commitment, right? Before it was just fun and games, and everybody enjoyed it, and it was, you know, you're on a high, you're on the, all the different brain chemicals that come up and make it feel like it's, you know, such a great romantic time. Now you are, the ball's back in your court, and it's time to say, is this gonna be it for the long haul, right? This is when you put in the investment, the real commitment that said, okay, now I'm actually putting in work. Now we're actually building something. And it's us that we are, <clears throat> this work that we put in now, we will reap the harvest in the future. And why is this phase necessary? You know, wouldn't it be great if it was just so easy and we all, uh, found a couple, you know, became a couple, found a partner, and through time it just grew and grew and grew and there was never any tough times. Well, in nature, it takes heat, it takes force to really build strong structures. Right? If we look at the blacksmith's trade, you couldn't build the strong tools that we use without the, the beating of the hammer and the, the heat of the forge to change the chemical construction of the, the steel or whatever metal they're using, they usually steel. <clears throat> so now is time to build the resiliency of your couple, right? It's these hard times that forge you as a couple into something stronger than the individual parts. And so what you do now is rounding out the quality of your relationship. Before, if this is the first difficult time that you've been through, you haven't really defined how you as a couple you know, the, the greater whole of the two of you react in these tough situations. And these tough situations are a lot of the reason why you would want to be in a couple together at all, right? It's fun to be together and do other things, but it's really powerful when a crisis comes up, the two of you can be smarter than the, the parts, you know, put your heads together and see things in different ways and come up with a way to approach these situations that's stronger than either of you could have done separately even if you're working together. But as a couple, the, you know, the mixing of the two energies brings something even more powerful than was possible before. And so this foray into difficulty, whether it's an external difficulty coming in or, you know, and disrupting the relationship or whether it's an internal between the two of you, <clears throat> you're now realigning your atomic makeup to say, uh, so to say, to build the new relationship. And so be very mindful of what you're doing now, because if, you know, a little carelessness at this point in the relationship can echo on for decades in the future um, because you didn't take the time to really build the structure now. And lastly, I'll say nature has a way of testing truths, right? A lot of the reason why relationships break up is because we came into it with fairy tales in our heads. We came to it with misconceptions about our partner and time and nature is the hates liars, right? Nature will test every truth. And if it's true, it will hold up, right? 
But if it's a falsehood, a fantasy, nature tends to destroy those things. So <clears throat> what we tell our partners about ourselves, what we imagine about our partners is going to be stripped away over time. And this is one of the first strippings. And so if you are willing and you'd love your partner for what they truly are, when the mask comes off, you'll still love them. But if you love them or they loved you for what they thought you were, then that's when you have difficulty. So embrace these trying times because it's the acid washing away the external facade and finding the true germ of the seed inside. So here's two methods to, that you can do to work through these times and to try to make a better decision. One, what is the best thing, you know, uh, this is a journaling method, so I would imagine writing down or just think to yourself, what is the best thing that you could, that could happen if you stay together? If you're in a place where you can do this with your partner, so much the better, but I would do it separately at the very least and then maybe come together and think of these things that, together and compare answers and so forth. But imagine what the goal is, you know, what is the best possible thing that could happen if you stay together? And what is the best possible thing that can happen if you break up? You know, be objective about this. Try to be as unemotional as possible. And then look at either option and say which really fulfills your highest good, the best you could give out. Not necessarily the easiest road, not necessarily the most comfortable or fastest road to um, whatever you deem to be success, but what is the best possible thing you could give out? <clears throat> and then why would you be afraid of taking that path? Many times, these the highest path seems the scariest, and so we need to really head-on face these fears that we're you're likely to have about you know what could go wrong, uh, what might be you know a hardship, what might not feel comfortable at the time, and then also separately, what exterior forces could stop you? Right. So the, the fears are really something about us, right? You can be afraid of a thing or not. And it, it could change or not, but it doesn't matter because you are looking at it. The fear is something you're projecting on the exterior qualities. Exterior forces could actually stop you. You know, like I may not get a job in that place and that therefore this dream wouldn't work out. That's an exterior force. Um, and there, those are things to be coped with. So it's good to put those in, in two separate lists. Method two, why we fight. And this is a goal setting uh, method. And if you haven't checked out my the previous two days in this lesson, um, you may want to check those out because I go into more into depth about goal setting type stuff that you can do with your partner to really clarify why you're together and what you're doing. And it gives you having a goal set in the future gives you a reason to stay together. There's always going to be tough times. There's always going to be difficult situations. And what gets us through these, what makes us put in the hard work, is by having that light a little bit in the distance, saying, you know, yeah. You're not in a good spot now, but the dawn will come and you will get to where you're walking to, to where you're going to. And so what I recommend is doing this as a partnership. Um, get your partner involved. If you can't get them involved because of the difficulties in the situation, try to do it yourself. But both of you being on board makes it such a much more, so much more powerful. Um, first thing to do is lay out all of your dreams anything you can think of that you want to do as a couple and as individuals. You know, couples will have individual goals outside of the couple, and then there'll be couple goals, you know, building a household together or children or, you know, even professional goals where you're doing it together. It, uh, the sky's the limit here, so don't try to, to say, you know, this is not realistic or we can't do this and this. You know, that's, now's not the time for that. Just put everything out there, as much as you can think of, that really resonates and feels strongly emotionally connected to your 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 core psyche and your core being. There's a lot of dreams that people have where it's, you know, I, I want to do X, Y, Z, but, you know, it's just kind of like flat. It's just something they got off TV or the parents told them or something. They don't really feel emotionally connected to it. So try to weed out those ones. Next, rank them in order equitably. You know, so one partner gets something, the other partner gets something, the relationship gets something. And now is the time to say, okay, um, I like this and like this, but I would really be happy if I got this thing, right? That's enough for me to get started. And if this other stuff happens, so much the better, but these few things are really, really where my happiness lies and where my partner's happiness lies. And once you have this list, make a visual representation of the list that you can put up and that both partners can see, whether it's a vision board, some kind of plan, a diagram, a timeline, Whatever, you know, it's hard to say one because it, one thing doesn't work for everybody. 
And in fact, one thing may not work for both partners. So you may find yourself to where you each partner needs the same plan, but in two different forms, one right next to each other, that resonates strongly. And the, the point of this isn't really, it's not like a construction plan or something that you have to follow to the letter. It's really to give you that little bit to look at throughout the day for when you, ever you walk by, it gives you that remembrance of, oh yeah, this is why I'm here. This is why we're fighting. This is what the hard times are building towards. This ultimate relationship that we're going to have in the future and this life that we're building together that we couldn't build separately. So this has been phase three of permacultural relationships, survival of the fittest. I have a handout with those exercises as well as the slides and a, a recording of this talk on permaculture relationship or permaculture, sorry, offgridpermaculture.com slash relationships. And uh, go there if you're interested and check out our live stream tomorrow for phase four of off-grid permaculture relationships. Hello, my name is Shota M. Luna, and I'm with the St. Paul's University. So the topic for today is, do past life experience, love experiences affect you, your choices in future love or romantic experiences? My theory is yes. So what do you think? Do you keep attracting the same kind of partners, friends, lovers? Is this you really doing this over and over again? Is the whole world have the same kind of men, the same kind of women? Is this you who is attracting all these people? Could you actually blame somebody else? No, really it's you. You're attracting the same kind of person. The, one of the reasons you can say why is because your first love, maybe it affected you. Have you heard people say, this lady married his, her mom, and you seem to attract the same kind of person over and over again. One of the reasons could be because of your first love. Your first love was you could have been your mom, your dad, and if you didn't have a mom or a dad, sorry. But um, you probably heard the saying, she married her dad. He married someone like her mom, like his mom. One of the reasons is because your mom, as she's breastfeeding you or bottle feeding you, if you're a mom, can you remember when they looked up at you with those beautiful loving eyes? That baby just loves you. No reason why unconditional love. So that's where that saying comes from. I myself married my father. I remember my father. My father had 12 kids altogether. And my father used to carry me piggyback. And at one time he bought me some shoes. I love those shoes. Back in the day, they were penny loafers where you can put a penny in them. I love those shoes. And I loved my, I, I loved my dad. So unfortunately, I married someone like him. My father was an alcoholic and a wife beater. So I married him twice. Men that had the same traits as him because he was my first love. So I picked the same kind of person over and over again. It happens to, this happens to all of us, billions of people that are on this earth. Why? Because we keep on picking the same kind of people over and over again. It's like, yeah, there's this saying that you can hear. Um, 
that saying says, all men are alike. All women are alike. They're all the same. Well, yeah, you got to blame somebody because <laughs> you keep attracting the same kind of people over and over again. So people keep on finding and choosing the same type of persons, partners, friends, lovers, men or women. Sometimes we do it unconsciously. How can we change that? How can we change um, the way we pick our, our lovers? Can we change that? Yes. So what, are you, what do you have to do? You have to change. You be, have to be attracted to a different kind of person. You have to ask yourself and that person a lot of questions. One really important question is, do you have a job? A J-O-B. <laughs> My mom used to also give us advice on always check a man's feet. Why? She used to say, because back in the day, we had to find someone that could support us and the kids we were going to have. So she said, look at their feet. If their shoes were clean and polished, that man cared about himself and what he looked like. If the shoes were modern, the man had money. So my mom also used to say, before you marry someone, go, go check out the parents. He's going to take you to meet his parents, right? So she said, check out and see how he treats the mom and dad. If he treats them with respect and love, once he gets comfortable with you, he's going to treat you the same way, with love and respect. And same with the, you know, the, the, like my son, I told him to do the same thing. Check out how she uh, reacts to her parents. Is she loving? Is she respectful? One real important thing I told him, and make sure she can cook. And can she clean house? A lot of times when we fall in love, we go, oh, okay, well, if he doesn't know how to fix a car, change the oil, maybe I can do it. My mom always used, also used to say to my brothers, if you can't feed them how they are accustomed to, leave them there. Don't elope. You have to say, you know, got to feed them and support them. And they'd say, oh, but we don't have to eat. I'm so in love. I don't need to eat. Can she cook? Can she clean house? Do you think she's going to be a good mom if she has your kids? Or when we fall in love, are, is the man going to be able to support me? Does he have a J-O-B, a job? And how's he going to treat his children? Check that out, check that out. And if you are going to marry a man who already has children, child support. Broke. <laughs> That's a hard one. But if he knows how to treat your kids well, and he's not the kind of person that doesn't, you know, doesn't, can't get along with the, your children, your friends, he, he has to take care of everybody. He's got to be a person with a big heart that could handle your mother, your father, your family. The whole enchilada. <laughs> That's very, very important. So how do you like your men? How do you like your women? They're still there. Is there really someone for me, you'd ask? Yes. There is someone for you. You just have to change your ways of attracting the same kind of men. The law of attraction is very, very important. You can also write a list. <laughs> That's a big list. If you're going to write a list, put what you really want in a person, not what you don't want. Because like a lot of traction, you put down what you don't want, that's what you're going to get. The universe says, oh, okay, I sounded like that's what I wanted, what that person wanted. One of the things that I do want to mention to mothers who are looking for someone 
in their lives. Be very, very careful who you pick. There are some very uh, men who think bad and they could mistreat your kids. Or, the, or they'll re, they will want you your kids to respect them because I'm supporting them. They need to respect me. And then there's uh, some others that are women that they prefer to be good to their own kids and, and won't be good to the man's kids. It happens all the time. I'm really, really sorry about that. But I do want to emphasize to be very, very careful if you're going to go as a single parent, who you're going to pick. Because in reality, yeah, it's your life and you can do what you want, but you don't realize that there's other people all around you, your kids, your friends, your mother and father, other people that love you. And when you pick someone, he's going to marry everybody. Because what if he doesn't like your, your friends? It happens. I don't like your friends. Then what are you going to do? Give him up? I don't think so. Because once you get married, you want to stay married, there's a lot of compromising. <laughs> so how desperate are you? And what are you willing to sacrifice? There's a lot of things and depends on, oh, I'm too old. I'm getting too old. I need to get married. You're just sometimes really desperate. We were, we need someone in our lives, we think. Be, again, be very careful with your children. And those who love you, it affects who you marry or pick to live with. Law of Attraction. Well, thank you very much for listening. My name is Rosa M. Luna, and you can find me at rosamluna.com. And thank you for listening. Take care. Well, uh, in this day and age, we have another great thing that's developed and uh, opened up for us uh, beyond all the strict roles that there used to be for human beings to hide behind who they really were. It appears at this time that LGBT relationships allow us to be who we really are, and uh, more than we have just a particular female or male role. The truth is, I believe, human beings uh, have more in common. Males have a female part. Females have a male part. As human beings, we have that more in common than we have separate. So it is wonderful that we don't have to uh, have our close, intimate relationships stuck in particular um, male or female patterns and can open up to a wider range and be aware of just enjoying uh, people as they are. I believe that's where the truth of relationship is in, uh, beyond our sexuality and including our sexuality. Uh, as something wonderful that contributes in whole new dimensions than um, the simple male-female dimensions. So we can celebrate that. And one of the nice things that's interesting about it is a new way of referring with pronouns. Instead of using his and her all the time, now people who are questioning... Um, or transsexual, whatever, can be them and they. So they refer to themselves as a them or a they. And um, that makes it clear that they're not stuck in a 
particular relationship and particular piece of the role model that our culture has uh, infinitely uh, stuck us in in years past. So we are unstuck and roaming the world in new ways. That's the 21st century. And welcome to day three in our web series. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the post honeymoon phase. Um, this phase is pretty um, dreaded and feared by some couples. Um, often it, it's a period that can make or break a relationship. Um, so it is a phase where um, you know ten, we tend to take off those road colored glasses. Um, you know we're no longer infatuated with this person and um, oftentimes um, this is where disagreements and fights can start happening a little bit more. Um, some couples um, feel a little taken for granted, you know, their partner stops taking them out on dates and things get a little too comfortable and people get a little too um, complacent. So, but I think this is an important phase in a relationship it's an opportunity to really um, learn and grow as a person and also as a couple. Um, so there are um, a couple of tips that I can give to help kind of get over this slump or rut that you're in, um, in this post honeymoon phase. So one, um, don't take each other for granted um, and don't become complacent. You know, make sure that you're still setting aside some time every week um, to really kind of connect and, and make sure it's quality time. Um, also, if there's little things that you do for each other um, that become more like a chore and routine, um, try to take it up a little notch. Like let's say you make um, coffee every day for your partner. Um, you know, maybe leave a little note in their lunch that says, I love you. and Kind of just remind yourself what it, why you started this little routine to begin with. It's just a way of kind of showing, you know, your affection that you think about them and that you care about them. Um, so it's good to just kind of remind yourself, um, you know, of the little things that you do for each other um, that kind of show affection and show your love for one another. Um, number two, um, give each other some space and time. Um, Usually when we're in a relationship at first, um, we start to spend less and less time with our friends um, or we kind of put aside our hobbies because we're very much um, just really focused on this new relationship and this new person. So the post honeymoon phase is a good opportunity to take a step back and to evaluate what you're neglecting in yourself in that area. Um, so if you've been neglecting your friends, start making some dates again with them. Um, most people are understanding because we've all gone through that phase where, you know, we get a little too wrapped up in our own little world. Um, so start going out with your friends again. Um, start pursuing your hobbies again. Um, make sure that, you know, your partner is pursuing his um, or her um, hobbies and interests as well. You know, you don't have to spend every single um, you know, time off together. It's actually really, really healthy to give each other some, some space and pursue other interests. Um, so the next one, um, realize no one is perfect. Um, obviously this is a time where, you know, you're going to realize, uh, taking those rose colored glasses off that, uh, your partner isn't perfect and there there's things that they do that drive you crazy or maybe little habits or quirks that were once kind of oh cute but now are kind of getting annoying 
And uh, you realize, you know, no matter how many times you ask them to, you know, pick up after themselves, maybe um, that they just can't seem to remember. <laughs> so it's a good time to realize like, okay, my partner's not perfect, but I'm not perfect either. Um, and when you can, you know, be forgiving of yourself and your mistakes, um, it makes it easier to forgive other people of their mistakes and imperfections. Um, number four, reevaluate. So this is a period where you're no longer on your best behavior uh, and you really start to see um, the other person and they see you um, as you really are. You know, um, we maybe are not as patient as we used to be. Um, maybe we're not, you know, going along with everything our partner wants. Um, you know, this is a good time to kind of reevaluate and look to see if there was any red flags towards the beginning that we that we ignored are now going to be, you know, really blaring spotlights. Um, and we need to sit and think, is this, is it important? Um, do I need to think about this seriously? Um, for example, maybe your partner um, likes to drink every weekend. And at first it was fun because you guys had fun, but now it's kind of like, okay, not every weekend. Um, they might have a problem um, and that might, not, might need to be, you know, faced. Um, so it's a good time to kind of uh, take a step back and see if there are, you know, important issues that need to be discussed and, you know, if they're harmful um, and potentially dangerous then definitely um, you kind of need to reevaluate things and think about your future. Um, you definitely don't want to become someone's caretaker. Um, you know, you if it's important to be independent and be responsible and accountable for our actions. Um, and if our partner is not willing to be accountable, um, that's going to be problematic. So. Number five, make gratitude list. So during really, really tough days, uh, when you get frustrated um, or maybe angry or you've gotten a you know, fight, uh, you know, after you've cooled off, um, it's good to kind of just sit down, grab a piece of paper and pen, and think about you know, why you fell in love with this person to begin with. Make a list of all the things that you love about them um, that you appreciate them, maybe write down some memories that you guys had. Um, so it's really good every now and then, even when you don't have tough days, every once in a while to just let your partner know um, that you appreciate them and that you are grateful um, for everything they brought into your life, but also who grateful for the person that they are. And number six, Choose your battles wisely. Um, we don't want to make mountains out of molehills, and we don't want to fight with every, um, you know, mistake that our partner makes. Sometimes it's uh, best just, you know, if it's a one-time thing, not to make a big deal of it. Um, obviously, if it's a bad habit and it's annoying and it's you know, disrupts your quality of life, then that needs to be taken care of, sure. But um, if it's something smaller, um, you need to kind of learn to just kind of let go and go with the flow. Um, you know, ask yourself, is this going to matter next week um, or next year for that matter? And if not, then it's probably good just to, you know, not worry about it. And the last one, number seven, um, is to be adventurous. So if you're feeling like life has become a tedious routine and you're feeling like you're in a rut and every day is looking the same, um, this is an important time to start to be adventurous. Uh, try new things. Um, depending on your budget, it doesn't have to be a grandiose thing, but you can um, do anything from going away to, uh, on a weekend to a place you've never been or, you know, maybe looking at if you both like to cook, you know, finding some new recipe that you've never, um, you've never tried. Um, maybe it 
completely different, uh, you know, international dish and, um, you know, give it a try. Um, maybe go on a new hike or, you know, um, head out to the beach for the day, go on a day trip and build sand castles and have fun and be silly. Um, it's really important that you break out of the routine um, and have fun because you should never take life too seriously. So I hope those tips help and I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye.